I'm going to talk about what we need to do very simplistically and why we need to work together and why materials development is so important. So materials are really important. We make nearly everything out of them. We name standards and universities anniversaries after them. We judge people by their material possessions we shouldn't do. We wear them for prestige. We've named prehistoric ages after them. So, and we use them nearly for everything, communication, electricity, water, in water, producing and preparing food. So they're very, very important. Now I'm going to take a different tack and look at human problems. And I've just listed them there. But overpopulation, diminishing resources, messing up the environment, et cetera, et cetera. OK, and then what I've done is I'm asking the question, where are we going with our human problems? And basically, if we carry on like this with our human problems, we've got an unsustainable future. And what that means is that your children are going to have a worse life than you. And nobody wants to bequeath their children a worse life than them. So how many of these problems can be helped by materials? Not overpopulation, diminishing resources, yes. To a certain extent, um, climate change can be. Not habitat destruction, pollution can be. Wasting resources can be, because we can use them better. Consumerism, um, that's yes and no. And you might think, why is that a problem? But I'll unpack that in a minute. Uh, inequality partially, lack of clean water partially, and unsafe environments partially. So what I'm trying to show is, is human prob uh, problems can be helped by materials. So what materials do we need for solving problems? Well, more sustainable materials. And you might think, wow, what does that mean? Well, more efficient materials. Do, do a better job, do a different job, or be easier to, to process so that you don't waste so much energy. Materials which can last a long time, so you don't need to um, keep replacing them. Materials which degrade so they don't sit around and mess up the environment. And if you can notice a slight problem here, don't worry. Then we want materials that can be recycled or materials that can be repurposed. And then what we need to do is we need to improve established materials, develop new materials, and maybe develop new processes. And you can think of this as a triangle, but anywhere within that, you can be doing good stuff, which could be and should be more um, sustainable materials. So what I've done is I've put together the two slides. So and it looks horribly complicated. And those of you who are observant will see that we've got a contradiction in here because we we want mater some materials we want to last a long time. Like if we're cutting another material and machining, we don't want to keep changing the bits. And in other places, we want materials which de which can degrade, like polymer bags from the supermarket. So we want contradictory things from materials. We'll come back to that. And then there's beneficiation. Now, Africa has got loads of mineral wealth, and this is very simplistic. So as you go from here, you are increasing value, OK, from the ore to the metals to the alloys to semi finished products to finished products. And then I've put branding in there because that's a whole different psychological thing as well. And I don't know enough about that. And consumerism, I said that was good and bad. It's a double edged sword. So it's good for jobs, development, wealth creation, and it should lead to reducing inequality. But it's bad because it's increasing the inequality between the haves and the have nots. And we're not using items to full, their full capacity. And we've got a throwaway society where we tend to want the latest, the newest, instead of sort of being happy with what we've got. Now, OK, having the latest and the newest 
leads to industry and leads to commercialization, which leads to wealth. But we are, we are on a throwaway society. So either you can have more in the dumps, which is in the sea, increasing pollution, even in landfill, this is land dumps, and so it's pressure on the environment, or you can give some or sell some to the have-nots. So you've got a recycling opportunity with it, or you've got a recycling opportunity with the materials that make it up. So they, there can be good things, there can be spin-offs of that. This is very simplistically, I know. And then life cycles, simplistically, in the bad old days, you'd have the ore, the raw materials, maybe you'd make products. And then when you finish with them, they'd end up in the dump or in the sea. And what you can have is you can have recycling within production or you can have reuse. But what you really ought to have is instead of dumping it, it should be recycled and be reused and repurposed. And we need to do more of this. And what is really nice, and you can see in South Africa, and I'm sure it's happening in other parts of the world and other parts in Africa, there's a lot of informal recycling going on. And that's great because it's giving somebody um, an income and it's also helping the environment and it's employing people. And we talked about developing new materials. So they must do the job and safely, they must be available. So we need a reliable supply. They must be cost effective and they shouldn't have any detrimental safety implications to the environment. They should be cost effective to manufacture. They should be acceptable by industry. And industry actually doesn't like changing things. If they've got an alloy that they know how to deal with, they don't like changing with it because they know how to deal with it unless there's a really, really good advantage, like it's much higher temperature or it's lower density or something. And recycling is becoming increasingly important, especially if you want to do um, export and selling to um, especially first world countries. But there are some legalistic complications. Everybody thought asbestos was, was great. We had a there's a good aspect, there was a good asbestos in industry. And then it was realised that it's not such great at all and trying to keep away from it. It's got its uses, but you've got to be very careful with it. And then looking at the structural and other properties of materials, there's a whole load of strength. I've put it inverted commas, ductility, all these. I'm probably teaching to the converted here. And Basically, you want different things out of your materials. So basically, no one material can fill all the necessary requirements because you might want um, you, you might want good thermal expansion or bad thermal expansion. You might, might want electrical, electrical conductivity for, say, wires for conducting electricity, or you might want some insulation properties so that's the coating that goes round it, all, all the cable covers. And then material properties are variable. They depend on the microstructure, which depends on the conditions, uh, the temperatures, sometimes the pressures. And this is a titanium alloy. Don't worry too much about it. There's the composition um, and the name of it. But in two different conditions so after two different heat treatments okay and it's going to give you totally totally different properties this will probably give you the best properties because it's a finer microstructure so other properties of materials that people think about i've put it in inverted commas because they're not really proper properties but we have to think about it price that's not a constant Availability, that's not a constant. Ease of processing is not a constant because new methods come in or new legislation might stop you processing the way that you were doing it. Condition is not a constant. We've seen that in the last slide. Legislation is not a constant and fashion definitely isn't a constant. And things can change. Politics can happen. Um, a country might not produce or export the materials so much. 
China's got most of the tungsten in the world, but it doesn't like exporting it too much. Or there's better extraction techniques. Titanium processing is really difficult because it reacts with oxygen. And there's different ways of doing that. We haven't made a major breakthrough yet to do bulk protest, uh, processing of titanium, but we still keep trying. Then there's safety issues. Um, so asbestos I've talked about. Cobalt has got a safety issue. So people are trying to, to replace that. Also, it's another um, it's an another one where it's found in not so good places that are polits that are politically stable. And so you might want to change to different suppliers. You might get around it that way. So you might want to change the materials if you can't do that, or you use different processes. So what I'm trying to say is nothing is static. And then back to those properties. Why are they so important? Well, here I say why they're important. Strength is performance as well as safety. And you've got economics coming out. Some of the things we use them for um, corrosion resistance, stability, lifetime. A lot of this is safety density for fuel consumption. I don't know if you can remember the old heavy cars. They used to use up a whole load of fuel. As we got more and more careful with fuel, especially now with the fuel prices come, going up, you want a, a less dense motor vehicle so it doesn't use up so much fuel. Melting point um, affects the processing and it can also affect the safety. And then a whole load of things going on. So depending on the application, the, pro the properties are important. And this just shows the strength range of various structural materials. And you might think, wow, what about steel wires? Yeah, but which steel wires? Steel wires of different, different compositions. Most have got a fairly short range and uh, the steel wire wires have got a big range. And you'll see titanium alloys are stronger than aluminium alloys, which are usually stronger than magnesium alloys etc etc so you use them for different things and remember they've all got different other properties and then you've got to think of the density as well because that's important so metals are great in terms of having a high young modulus so they're quite stiff they're also quite heavy which you might not want so you might want to reduce the heaviness by thinking of ceramics but you need to think of ceramics properties they can be really brittle and then do you want something that's flexible OK, rather than stiff. So the density issues are really important. Then we have to think, what should the materials do? Particular applications have got specific needs. They've got tolerances and we have to find out which materials fulfill those needs. And then the tolerances and the specific needs normally give us the specifications that this gives us the design envelope and then we can go and search for a particular material. And there's new materials happening all the time. Some are cheaper, some are easier, cheaper or safer to process. Some are easier to obtain. Some came about because of new legislation. Some came about because they're easier to recycle. Some do the job better, higher temperature, they last longer, or they do a different job. And some materials come about because academics and researchers, you can call it researching or you can call it playing, to find to do more things. So what do we need to consider? Not all materials can do everything. We need to check the needs and the environment carefully and the environments that they work in might be different environments. We need to know our materials limitations and we need to check the effect of processing. Be aware of the limitations or weaknesses and also remember that things can change legislation, availability, the processing depends on the environment and the legislation. We can't get away with doing things the way we used to do. New materials in general, nanomaterials are good for certain techniques, but how do we stop them from coarsening? Icosahedral materials were all the rage about 20, 15 or 20 years ago, but they're, they have got their uses. They, they've got some really interesting properties. People are still looking at them and they get used a little bit. 
And the latest fad is high entropy alloys, now called complex concentrated alloys. There's a lot of hype around them, but I'm not sure if there's really any success yet. But the other thing is new combinations of materials. So a lot can go on in materials research. Then new processes. Another thing that's coming on and is very important is additive manufacturing. And this is where you build up your, your, your component layer by layer with a laser. And yes, things are being made by this, and, but there are still some problems. One of them is that the powder is melted even for a short time and you need good powders, homogeneous and, and spherical as you can for flowability. Spark plasma sintering is quite a new technique um, and it retains finer structures, so it's quite good. There's various coating techniques which are coming forward. They've got to be high quality and they've got to be reproducible. And NIMS in Japan, they've got a coordinated development program. And basically what they do is they simulate their design. Then they do some various processing and they look at all sorts of things, microstructures and properties, and then they would try and put it into to service. So this is a turbine blade going into an advanced jet engine. And they do have lots of alloys going into their work, but it's a coordinated development program right from the design and the simulation through the whole load. OK, so why can't we do that? If we have a simplified workflow, we can have a whatever idea, we can model it, OK? We can check the phases in there, in the modelling. We can do experiments, OK? We can also have new theories, and we can either model those or go straight to experiments. If our experiments work, we can maybe have a scale up. If that works, we can go into feasibility studies and maybe to a pilot plant and then eventually down the line. I didn't go onto it, but would be the pilot plant and then do it commercially. But what I'm trying to get across is there's different sections of looking at this and different people have got different expertises. I know of some very good modelers, but they don't do any. They don't do much experimental work, but they could show us some things that we and this has happened model some new compounds the exper experimentalists make it and way you've got a new compound which has got new materials there's some different sorts of modeling that people look at and then america um they've got this materials genome initiative or mgi and this was 2019 which was three years ago and what they're trying to do is increase the pace of new materials deployment. They love that word by complementary efforts in theory, computation and experiment and seamless integration. And if we go back to slides, modeling, theory and experiments. OK, and they want seamless integration. And what that means is working together. OK, so how should we work? We should combine our expertise because nobody's an expert in everything. And we should combine different techniques, different modeling and different experimental techniques. We should improve access to specialized equipment. We've got quite a lot of specialized equipment in Africa. We should do that. The other thing we should do is not only we should we work together, but we should work with industry. And academics can be really good at having a brilliant idea, do really good work, but nobody's interested in, on it. And the other thing, we should change the ways that researchers and their work, the, the way that researchers work together and are judged. So we should reward innovation as well as papers and students. We should reward collaborations and discourage silo mentality. mentality. We should become collaborative rather than competitive. But at the moment, the way most universities work in South Africa is they want papers and students. They not so much interested in collaboration because they want more of the glory, but that's bad because you're not putting together different um, expertises and they tend to want you to be competitive and be better than the university up the road rather than collaborate with them. 
and we should be doing these things so we can work together. Now, South Africa's decadal plan should help this. OK, but what about the rest of Africa? Well, we've got the Arua African Research Universities Alliance, Centre of Excellence in Materials, Energy and Nanotechnology. And our mission is to use research to develop human capacity for Africa to solve African problems and help make Africa globally competitive. So what do we want to do? We want to develop materials, some for energy and some using nanotechnology for Africa and have solutions for Africa. We want to develop people, especially young career researchers, and that means students as well. We want to have meaningful networking and collaborations, so we don't want to be competitive. And in order to do this, we want to grow by leveraging funds. And then COVID came along and made things very difficult for us, which is why we've got these these videos. Now, we've got some existing facilities in Arua COE MEN, Materials Engineering and Nanotechnology. We've got electron mi microscopes, X-ray diffraction, corroding te corrosion testing, thermodynamic calculations. We've got all of these. We can share them a bit more and work together. And these are the themes of, of, Arua, at the, of Arua COE MEN at the moment. Um, energy materials, um, various different things, as you can see. Lying in the middle is improving the effectiveness and efficiency of materials. So that affects all of those. The others do overlap a bit. And then also lying in the middle, but further outside, is how society is affected by materials. So go back to the first part of this talk. And that's all that I'm trying to get across. We're trying to get to the end of the rainbow and there's one way of getting there, maybe. Thank you very much.